All right, so let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll get into our time together. So, Heavenly Father, just ask that you be with us tonight as we're gathered here together once again to open up your word. Be with us now as we study this important topic of the 144,000 in the great multitude. Last time we looked at 666, and we saw the mark of the beast. And now here in Revelation 7 and Revelation 14, we're going to see the mark of God's people which we want to be a part of. And so be with us now as we open up your word. We ask for your Holy Spirit as we do each night. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so 2 Corinthians chapter 1. We looked at this last night, but I want to just read it again as we move into the seal of God with the 144,000. It says, For all the promises of God in him are ye, and in him, amen, unto the glory of God by us. Now he which establishes us with you in Christ and hath anointed us is God who hath done what? He has sealed us and given us the earnest of his spirit in our hearts. Now we recognize that there is a desire in each of our hearts to be sealed by the Holy Spirit. But I believe that that gets stronger and stronger as we continue to grow in our understanding, right, of him. And that's what we want. We want to have that strong faith and I believe that happens because the Spirit is increasing. And John the Baptist says, well, as that increases, what happens to us? Yeah, we decrease. Ephesians chapter 1, in whom you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom you also after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of his glory. So even though we are saved, we, we make that decision to follow Christ and we're sealed. Does that mean now we're done? No, we continue to grow, don't we? And so we recognize that that ceiling, that recognition of the Holy Spirit in our lives and Jesus Christ as being the center and foundation is the starting point. We even use that same analogy I do when I'm talking about baptism. Oftentimes we see baptism as being the end of the journey. Well, no, it's not. Baptism is the beginning of the journey. It's my initial decision to follow Christ and to continue to learn about him each and every day. So let's go ahead and read this in its entirety. I know we're going to take a deep breath as we read through this. But I'm going to come back and I'm going to look at all these things that I've highlighted and underlined. All right, let's read this. Revelation chapter 14. So I looked and behold, he sees a lamb standing on Mount Zion. And with him 144,000 having his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, like the voice of many waters, and like the voice of loud thunder. And I heard the sound of the harpists playing their harps. They sang, as it were, a new song before the throne, before the four living creatures and the elders. And no one could learn that song except the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. These are the ones who were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These were redeemed from among men, being first fruits of God and to the Lamb. And in their mouths was found no deceit, for they are without fault before the throne of God. And then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him who made heaven and earth and sea and springs of water. And another angel followed him, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And then a third angel followed them, saying, with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or in his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever. And they have no rest day or night who worship the beast in his image. And whoever receives the mark of his name, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. You're going, wow, that's a lot of stuff to kind of take in. As I said, we'll go through tonight and, and highlight some of these. So let's also look at the parallel passage in Revelation chapter 7. After these things, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, on the sea, or on any tree. 
Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. Interesting question here, just really quick. We just said we want to be sealed by who? The Holy Spirit, right? Interesting. Is the Holy Spirit God? Sure, right? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And he cried with a loud voice of the four angels of whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of those that were sealed. Here's that number again. The 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel were sealed. And then it goes on to say that after these things I looked and behold now he sees a what? Great multitude which no one could number of all the nations and tribes and peoples and tongues standing before the throne and before the Lamb clothed with white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice saying salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Then one of the elders answered, saying to me, Who are these arrayed in white robes, and where did they come from? And I said to him, Sir, you know. And so he said to me, These are the ones who come out of great tribulation, and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So who are this 144,000? Because there's a lot of different ideas, as I said, that are out there of, of who these people represent. So let's go ahead and start breaking these down. If you thought we had done a lot of scripture in our previous meetings, just fasten your seatbelts, okay? Because we're going to look at a lot of scripture tonight because we want to be certain that who these are, okay? So we see that they are, that we saw a lamb that was standing on Mount Zion. We're going to look at these passages of scripture. I think you already know who the lamb is though, don't you? Who does the lamb represent? Yeah, Jesus. It's pretty obvious. But we're also going to look at these 144,000. We're going to see what the Bible says about, okay, God's name is written on their foreheads. They're singing a song only they could learn. What does that mean? And they were those redeemed from the earth, and they were not defiled with women. So let's look. I mean, we know this. Jesus is the one that's standing on Mount Zion. But in Joel chapter 2, verse 32, it says, Then everyone who calls in the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be those who escape as the Lord has said, and among the survivors shall be those whom the Lord calls. So to me, what we're going to see here is Mount Zion is kind of a victorious time. It's a time where people are going to be celebrating. And you and I know, isn't there going to be a celebration of the second coming of Jesus Christ? Absolutely there is. And we know we're going to see the Lamb at the second coming of Christ. Hebrews chapter 12 says this, But you have come unto Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven. So this is a celebration that's not just involving us, but who else do we have here in this passage? We have angels, right? We have all kinds of created beings that are there at this celebration. Well, don't you know, we've said that don't we have a guardian angel? So you think that guardian angel is going to be celebrating with us too when Jesus Christ comes? Absolutely, that's going to happen. And then Revelation, we know, again, the Lamb is Jesus. There in Revelation chapter 5, when Jesus came walking in as the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, who had prevailed at the cross, he was seen as a Lamb that had been slain. And so we recognize that certainly the Lamb standing on Mount Zion is Jesus standing there victorious, and you and I being a part of that in, in this celebration. All right, having the Father's name written on their forehead. Revelation chapter 7, which we had just read, said that there are going to be people that are sealed, right? The sealed servants of our God, where? On their foreheads. Now, we already saw when we looked at the mark or the seal that there are those that are sealed by the beast or really ultimately by Satan. And then on the other side, you have those that are sealed by God, right? Those that are sealed on their foreheads and on their hands, right? They, their actions and their thoughts. We saw the law of God is to be written in our minds and in our hearts. And so we start to see really, this is very simple, even there in the end of the book of Revelation, it says, and there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him, and they shall see his face, and his name shall be where? in their foreheads. In other words, we're not being branded again. It's just that our thoughts are ever on God. Isn't that something we look forward to? 
is that there is nothing else that we want to be around. There's no place else we'd rather be than in the presence of God. Now, an interesting one is here. It says about singing a song that only they could learn. One of the places you can look at is in Psalm chapter 40, and this is what it says. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. He brought me up also out of a horrible pit, out of a miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock, and established my goings. And he hath put a new song in my mouth. Even praise unto our God, many shall see it, and fear, and shall trust in the Lord. So you see what's happening here. There's, there's a, it's a song of deliverance, isn't it? Because they're being stuck in this miry clay. They're drowning and they don't know where to go and how to get out. And God reaches like with Peter down and pulls them out of this muck and miry clay. So this song is definitely a song of deliverance. And we even see in Revelation chapter 5 verse 9 that these people are singing a new song. And what are they saying? Thou art worthy to take the book to open the seals. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by the blood of every kindred tongue and people and nation. So this song is not just a song of deliverance, but it's also a song that's recognizing Jesus for what he is for us, right? He's a deliverer. He's our savior. He's our friend. He's our God. He's our companion. He's our advocate. And so you can see the huge celebration that's happening here. Another one that we cannot miss, and that is when the children of Israel were leaving Egypt, right? When they were taken out of Egypt and they followed Moses, they came to where? The Red Sea. And they saw it as an insurpassable place. But suddenly God delivered them. And after they got through, notice what happens. Exodus 14. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea, that the waters may come back upon the Egyptians and on their chariots and on their horsemen. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. And when the morning appeared, the sea returned to its full depth while the Egyptians were fleeing into it. So the Lord, what's it say? Does it say Moses overthrew the Egyptians? No, it says the Lord overthrew the Egyptians. And they began to celebrate. They began to sing. Exodus 15 talks about these songs that they were singing as they were looking back and saying, oh my goodness, there was nothing that we had done. He has done everything. He's the one that parted the Red Sea. He's the one that's delivered us. So at this celebration that we've got going on here, it's recognized that it's not us. That's why in the book of Revelation it says that even though we receive crowns, they take those crowns from their heads and throw them at the feet of Jesus because the celebration is about him. And so that's why it says, in, again, they were redeemed from the earth. Isaiah 51 reminds us of that. It says, therefore, the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come with singing unto Zion and everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain gladness and joy and sorrow and mourning shall flee away. So redeem means to be taken up, right? To be take, to be what? Taken care of. God is going to rescue us, deliver us. We are the redeemed. This is so important in Romans chapter 3 verse 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. Remember I shared with you about Joshua the high priest who was standing before God in judgment and Satan had taken the position of his right hand pointing the finger at him telling him that he's standing there in filthy garments but we have a redeemer, a Lord Jesus Christ who is going to redeem us. He's going to deliver us and we're going to have nothing but what? Praise and singing and we're going to be singing a song that no one else can sing, right? It's so important for us to see that. Now, this is where it gets a little difficult because people read this one. They say, wow, they're not defiled with women. In Isaiah chapter 24, it says that the earth also is defiled under the inhabitants thereof because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance, and broken the everlasting covenant. We're familiar with defile, right? We saw a defile. We saw how the, the sanctuary was polluted. We're familiar with this term. Even in Titus chapter 1, under the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. But even their mind and conscience is defiled. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate. 
So when you see this word or this phrase up here that says they're not defiled with women, you recognize that woman represents what? Church. But if it's talking about defiled, what church are we talking about? The woman dressed in white or are we talking about the prostitute? Yeah, we're talking about the prostitutes. So how is it that you and I can never be defiled by this? Because again, we saw in Ephesians chapter 5 that the woman is the church. How is that possible? The reality is it's nothing that you and I again can do. It's Christ in us that gives us the hope of glory, right? So when we sit here and we're singing this song and we're praising and we're worshiping him, again, it's all about what he has done. Not what we can do. Because we all fall short. Isn't that what we just read? All fall short. If we say that we are without sin, we are a liar and the truth is not in us. And so the reality is this is just, again, glorifying God even more. It's he that's able to accomplish this work, not us. And that's why it's so important that we see this in Matthew chapter 7. Jesus says this where he says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who do the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Oh Lord, did I not prophesy in your name? Did I not cast out demons in your name? Did I not do many deeds of power in your name? What's he say to them? I never knew you. Go away from me, you evildoers. So the reality is it's not all these things. Now again, I understand. Faith without works is dead. But we have to have it for the right motive. We don't just do the works for the sake of doing the works. We do them because they're a natural reaction to a love relationship with Jesus. That's why he says there that I want to know you, right? Because think about it. Does the devil know who he is? Sure he does. He spent who knows how many millennia with him. I don't know how long it was before the creation. But he knows who he is. But does he want to worship him? Does he want to truly follow him? Does he, is he really in love with him? No, those things are not true. But you and I, we want to have that kind of relationship with him. And so when we begin to look at this woman dressed in white, we recognize that the only way this can happen is through Christ. You and I can sit here and we can try and try and try. And there may be moments and times where we are successful. But in the long run, the only way that we can be successful, it says, we can do all things through Christ that gives us strength, right? And so we need him more and more and more. Another thing that's interesting about this, as you look at this woman dressed in white with the 12 stars and all these things that are, that are there, it reminds us of Genesis 37. This is the story of Joseph. Joseph dreamed this dream. You probably remember this. With the, he had the one with a coat of many colors. And he comes and he says, look, I, I had this dream. And in this dream, I saw the sun, the moon, and 11 stars. And what did they do to me? They bowed down to me. So he told it to his father and his brothers, and his father rebuked him and said, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall your mother and I and your brothers indeed come to bow down to the earth before you? The reality is, what was the answer? Yes, you will someday, right? When they come back to Egypt during that famine, they will bow down before him. They didn't see what was happening here. And so the reality is, you and I, we don't want to be a part of this woman. Yet we find ourselves many times doing the things that we know we shouldn't. Isn't that what Paul says? I don't do what I want to do, and I want to do what I don't. And I'm in this kind of, who's going to deliver me from this body of death? And what's he say? It's Jesus Christ that will deliver me. But Satan is constantly trying to work through all of these things, the abominations and filthiness of her fornication. He's leading the world astray. Notice how strong, listen to the way in which Jeremiah describes this. You, Israel, have played the harlot with many lovers. Yet return to me, says the Lord. Is there anywhere in the entire land where you have not been defiled by your adulteries? Remember we just said we're not defiled, it says in Revelation. By the road you have sat for them like an Arabian in the wilderness, and you have polluted the land with your harlotries and wickedness. Therefore the showers have been withheld. There has been no latter rain. You have had a harlot's what? Forehead, you refuse to be ashamed. You see the word starting to pop out to you as we're reading through this. Because we just talked about being marked on the forehead. If you don't know this, in Revelation chapter 9, or Ezekiel chapter 9, there's this idea of being marked. Here it's being marked, but it's the harlot's mark that's on the forehead. 
And as a result of being marked on the forehead, what is being withheld? The rain, the latter rain. And who is it that pours out the latter rain? The Holy Spirit. See, we're, at the, we're in this war in this, in this body, right? And the only one that can deliver me from this is, is Jesus Christ. We have to grow in a relationship with him. So this description that we're seeing here between these two women, you've got one that's clothed in purple, scarlet, adorned with gold and precious stones. And you've got the other side that's having the glory of God, radiant like a stone most precious. On one side, you've got one that's offering a cup filled with the abominations and filthiness of her fornication. On the other side, you have one that offers the water of life, clear as crystal. On this side, you've got Babylon as a habitation of devils. On the other side, you've got the tabernacle of God as with men, and he will dwell with them. On one side, you've got their names are not written in the Lamb's book of life. And then on the other side, you have only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. On the other side, we have those that are thrown down to be found no more at all. And on the other side, we have those that are going to reign with him in Jerusalem for how long? Forever and ever. So what we're seeing here with this 144,000, it's, it's really separating into two groups now. Remember I told you today, right now in 2022, at this very moment, there are still three groups. There are people that are still in that moment where they're trying to decide, am I going to follow Christ or am I going to follow myself or the world? But there's going to come a time, as I said before, that a decision will have to be made, right? Once probation closes, you now have only two groups. You have those that are part of the 144,000, those that are marked by God that we're talking about tonight, and you're going to have the other ones that are marked by the devil, right? Now again, we don't know when that time's going to come, but we're not going to wait until the raindrops fall, right, in the days of Noah, because it'll be too late. And so the Bible is being very clear here about what's happening. So let's keep going with this. So it says here, when we're talking about the 144,000, that they are the first fruits unto God. Let's look at what that means. Also, they are the sealed servants of our God. Let's take a look at a verse of that. And also, this is a really important one I think many misunderstand, and that is from the, the tribes of Israel. We're going to look at those verses as well. All right. So he ascended from the east and has the seal of the living God. That makes very good sense because east is a term that we're very familiar with even in the book of Matthew. Remember when Jesus was there? Jesus who was born in Bethlehem and they were following the star. What did they say they followed the star from? From the east. And we have come to worship him. Even at Jesus Christ's second coming, what's it say? As lightning flashes from east unto west, so also is the coming of the Son of Man. So it becomes very clear that the east represents Christ, right? And the seal of the living God. So let's look at this first fruits. Jeremiah chapter 2. We're probably familiar with this if you're a farmer or you're familiar with farming. The first fruits is the first portion of the larger crop. But let's look at some other portions here of scripture. Jeremiah chapter 2. Go and cry to the hearings of Jerusalem saying, thus says the Lord, I remember you, the kindness of your youth, the love of your betrothal, when you went after me in the wilderness, in a land not sown, Israel was holiness to the Lord, the first fruits of his increase. All that devour him will offend. Disaster will come upon them, says the Lord. So they were the first fruits of his increase, right? So that's very interesting because we just read a moment ago about 144,000, didn't we? But then a moment after that, we read another verse that also referred to a greater what? Multitude. So now you're starting to wonder to yourself, hmm, is one of first fruits of the greater multitude? Because here are the first fruits of his increase. We're probably familiar with this too. You've probably heard of tithe. Tithe is a first fruits of your increase. And so this is very familiar in scripture. In the book of James chapter 1, this is how it describes it. It says, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we might be a kind of what? First fruits of his creatures. In other words, you and I, let's say every one of us here in this sanctuary are saved. Are we the only ones that are saved? No, there's going to be others, right? That's going to continue to increase. 
I've been telling you, as you learn these truths from the Bible, what are we supposed to do? Keep it to ourselves? Or does the Bible tell us that we're supposed to go and present this and pre to preach this gospel to all the world? Yeah. Because we want that multitude to continue to what? Get greater and greater and greater. And so it shows here that even our group right here is a kind of first fruits of his, his increase. And so there's some things that I want to look at. Romans chapter five, or 8, verse 22. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also have the first fruits of his what? Oh, of his spirit. So that's interesting. So when I accept Jesus Christ as my personal savior, am I filled and overflowing with the spirit or am I getting a portion of the spirit of which the spirit will continue to grow as my devotion to him grows? Does that make sense? So I get the first fruits of his spirit. Even we ourselves grow within ourselves, eagerly awaiting for the adoption, the redemption of our bodies. So we get that spirit, but we desire more. Even here today, how many of us here want more of his spirit in our lives? Yeah, every one of us wants more of the spirit in our lives. And again, here, when you look at this Greek word, first portion or first fruits, it literally means anything, small portion, that is set apart to God before the remainder could be used. And so we're seeing this relationship. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, you're probably familiar with this. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, right? And he wants to do what? Call us out of darkness into what? His wonderful light. And so he wants that first fruits. He wants it to continue to grow and more people to come in and, with, and join this journey from us to heaven. Then it says that we are also, this 144,000 are the sealed servants of our God. We're familiar with this already, right? Revelation 14 told us that those that are sealed are the sealed of the Holy Spirit. It's written on their foreheads. Again, in chapter 22 of Revelation, it tells us that again, it's sealed on our foreheads. God knows those who are his. And you and I have made a decision that says that this world does not mean as much to us as... God does, right? Our focus is on heaven and not on the world. All right, let's take a look at this too. The tribes of Israel. In Numbers chapter 1, it begins to list the 12 tribes, right? Reuben, Simeon, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, Ephraim, Manasseh, Benjamin, Dan, Asher, Gad, Naphtali, right? We're familiar with them. But remember what happened in our earlier night. Remember how I told you each of these connects with the other. When we did the 490 year prophecy, what year did that end? Do you remember what it was? AD 34 with the stoning of Stephen, which brought an end. It was a probationary period for the children of Israel. Because we see Paul's talking about this, right? Ephesians, now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners. We are all what? What are we all? Fellow citizens with the saints. We are all from the household of God. We are all built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom all the buildings fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are builded together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. Again, Jesus himself, again, is the chief cornerstone, the foundation, because he is from the what? The lion, the tribe of Judah. James even is talking to these people there in the New Testament. He's going this, James, a servant of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes that are scattered abroad. The reality is if you look back what he's doing here, you remember the story of the Assyrians? The Assyrians had come in way before this time. And they had come into the northern kingdom of Israel and they'd taken the lost 10 tribes. You ever heard of the lost 10 tribes? What ended up happening is there was only two left, Judah and Benjamin. Well, what he's saying here is not that the lost 10 tribes are now being discovered. What he's saying is that we are all spiritual Israel. We are all part of God's family, his house. That's why he says in Galatians 3 that we are all what? Abraham's seed and what? Heir, according to the promise. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace be on them and mercy and upon the Israel of God. 
So these 12 tribes that it's talking about here is not like many are doing today in immediately saying, no, it's the Israelite nation of today that's applied to the 144,000. No, that's not what this is saying. It's being very clear that it's talking about spiritual Israel, which involves us. It's anybody. I don't care if you're a Jew. I don't care what nationality you come from. I don't care what church you come from. The call in the last days before probation closes is to come out of her, my people. It's everybody coming in, unified, all under the same banner of Jesus Christ. We are all Abraham's seed. We are all heirs. We are spiritual Israel. So when we begin to look at Revelation chapter 7 and we see these 12 tribes, people go, no, 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 that's, that's Israel. Well, here's the problem though. Let me show you something here. He identifies, John does, in Revelation chapter 7, Judah, Reuben, Gad, Aser, Naphtali, uh, Manasseh, Simeon, Levi, Issachar, Zebulun, Joseph, and Benjamin. And he has 12,000 for each of those tribes. So what I've done is I've gone and listed all the tribes from you from four different parts of the Bible. Revelation 7 that we just did, Genesis 49, Numbers 1, and Ezekiel 48. Now I want you to notice something here. The original 12 that are in the Bible, let's look at Genesis 49. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Zebulun, Issachar, Dan, Gad, Asher, Naphtali, Joseph, and Benjamin. Notice something here in Revelation 7, just to the left of that. Is Dan in that list? No, he's not in the list. Very interesting. Okay, so how, why would you leave off Dan? Why would you leave off Dan? Something's not right here. When I go to Numbers chapter 1, is Ephraim in my list in Revelation 7? No. Is again, you told me Dan is not in my list either. If I go to Ezekiel 48, again, Dan is not in my list and Ephraim is not on my list. So what's going on here? What is John trying to do? He's certainly not listing the original 12 tribes of Israel. Remember I just told you a moment ago, this is not about Israel because Israel as a nation, their probation closed with the stoning of Stephen. John clearly is trying to tell the reader something else here in listing these names. Because you'll see here Joseph is in there and Manasseh, which is actually his, his son. So let me show you something here. As I just said to you a moment ago, these 12 tribes, 10 of them were taken captive, right? And they disappeared. They were absorbed into the nation and they were lost, okay? But you have to ask that question. There are the two that I've highlighted in red. Why is John, what's his purpose? What's he trying to accomplish, again, for the reader by leaving off Ephraim and Dan from his list? If you go back to the Old Testament, the book of Hosea, chapter 12, it says that Ephraim has given bitter offense. So his Lord will bring his crimes down on him and pay him back for his insults. When Ephraim spoke, there was trembling. He was exalted in Israel, but he incurred guilt through Baal and died. Do you think as John is trying to describe the sealed people of God, the 144,000, do you think he wants to associate them with false worship? No, he's not going to do that. So he doesn't have Ephraim. In Genesis chapter 49, Dan, it says, was a, shall be a serpent by the way, an adder in the path that biteth the horse's heels so that his rider shall fall backward. If he's again trying to identify the people of God that are sealed here, is he going to want to associate them with being a stumbling block? No, he's not going to want them to be a, st a stumbling block. Absolutely not. Jeremiah chapter 4 involves both. It says, O oh, Jerusalem, wash your heart clean of wickedness so that you may be saved. How long shall your evil schemes lodge within you? For a voice declares from Dan and proclaims disaster from Mount Ephraim. So as John is trying to do something, remember I told you the book of Revelation is a symbolic book. He is trying to describe symbolically the people of God, this 144,000 that are sealed, this special first fruits group of the greater multitude. And he cannot have them associated with, as I said here, idolatry or, or being a stumbling block. So what's he doing? Let me show you something here. We have the Old Testament and we have the 12 tribes of Judah, right? If I go to the New Testament, what do I have? 
Don't I have 12 apostles? What is 12 times 12? Yeah, it's 144. Okay? So, again, if we're looking at the totality of spiritual Israel, right? Because, again, we're not from the tribes of Judah. We're not from the 12 apostles. But we know what they were preaching, right? What they were supposed to be preaching. The pure gospel, right? The disciples and the tribes of Judah. When you go through the Old Testament, book of Numbers mostly, other places, the number 1,000 is used as a military unit. You just told me that 12 times 12 is 144. Well, 12 times 12 times 1,000 is what? 144,000. How many were they identifying in Revelation 7 and 14? 144,000. So if you and I are seeing here and we're looking at the 12 tribes of Judah and the 12 apostles, the totality of the Bible in essence, are we not a total Bible-believing Christian, follower of God? We preach everything from Genesis to Revelation. And we're also supposed to be spreading this good news. Does that not put us kind of in a spiritual, military, almost a warfare? Are we in a warfare in our world today? I think we are. This 144,000, this first fruits, is identifying the people of God, this special people. Again, I haven't identified who they are yet. I'm going to. But these people are a special group of people that are going through spiritual warfare. Now, one of the places that we see in the Bible, you tell me, according to the Bible, is there a time that's going to be the worst that this world has ever seen? What was that time called? The time of trouble, right? The time of trouble. So do you think that this group is going to have the hardest time going through that period of time? Yes, absolutely. So we're starting to see what's happening here is he's describing these people that are sealed, not being sealed. They are sealed. That these people are going through a difficult time, but they are sealed by God. Does God take care of those who he knows, who he loves? Yes, he's not going to abandon them. He's going to care for them. He's going to be with them. But they're still going through spiritual warfare. They're still going through this military reality. So if I were to look at this on a timeline, okay? So here, let's, let's just go ahead and put probation closing. Okay, I'll put a line there. We don't know when this probation is going to close. But we know, are there people dying prior to that? Yeah, people are dying today. People have died in the past. People will continue to die up to that time. Once probation closes, you told me there is what Daniel 12 describes as a time of trouble. And it says it's the worst that this world will ever see. But we also know that Jesus after is going to come, isn't it? There's a second coming of Christ. So where do we put the 144,000? It becomes very clear to me that the 144,000, this special group, this first fruits, a smaller portion of the greater would be the people of God that are going through this time of trouble. But then it goes and it goes to the next few verses and it begins to describe this other group called the great multitude. Notice how it describes them. No man could number. All nations, kindreds, tongues, and peoples, clothed in white robes, palms in their hands, coming out of great tribulation, serving God day and night in his temple. Let's, let's look at some of these verses if you're not clear on what each of these means. No man could number. Remember in Genesis chapter 13, 16, he's told Abraham that I will make thy seed as the what? Dust of the earth. Now this is kind of a sad situation because as we're going to learn this later in our nights, that even though there is a great multitude that will be in the kingdom of heaven, will that great multitude be more or less than the wicked? It will be less because we know that the people of God are the remnant. There's a greater number of wicked than there are righteous, even though they do number the sands of the sea or the dust of the earth. Isaiah 61 says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness. Is that something that we put on or is that something he puts on us? Yeah, it's something that he puts on us. He did that with Joshua the high priest. Even though he was in filthy garments, it was he that robed him in, in righteousness. You're probably familiar with this, right? When Jesus came riding in on the foal, what were people laying down as he was coming in? 
Yeah, the palm branches. John chapter 12 says, as on the next day, people were coming to the feast, and when they heard that Jesus was coming, they took palm branches, and they went and they threw them on the ground and were crying out what? Hosanna. Blessed is the King of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. At the second coming of Jesus, this great celebration. Do you think there's going to be a great celebration? Absolutely there is. Blessed is he, the king of which we serve. Psalm 92 says, Mine eye also shall see my desire of mine enemies, and my ears shall hear my desire of the wicked that rise up against me. The righteous shall flourish like the palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. So we see that palm trees are representative of a celebration. And so we know that this great multitude is definitely having a celebration. Notice this too. Come out of great tribulation. In Mark chapter 4 it says, The ones sown on stony ground, who when they heard the word, immediately received it with gladness. And they have no root in themselves, and so endure for only a time. Afterward, when what? tribulation or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they stumble. Okay, this doesn't say the great tribulation. Can you and, are you and I going through tribulation today? Would you say if I went back to the Protestant Reformation that they were going through tribulation? Absolutely. Okay, there's a difference between the tribulations that you and I go through on a daily basis and the great tribulation that's going to take place after probation closes. We have to make sure we know that there's a difference between them. So this great multitude is not talking about those necessarily that are going through the great tribulation. It's talking about this great multitude being anybody that has ever gone through tribulation for God, for the sake of God. Many have died as a result of their faith. Romans chapter 8 says, Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died, and furthermore it is also risen. Who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us? Here it comes. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? So that to me is describing anybody who's ever gone through any of these since the very beginning. From Genesis all throughout time, anybody that has gone through that. That could then be anybody that is part of that great multitude. Serving God day and night in his temple. We know what that means, but let's just read it. Revelation 22. There shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it. And his servants shall serve him, and they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. And there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light from the sun. Some people ask me, oh, there's no more sun anymore. No, there's still a sun. There's just no need of the sun in this city of which God dwells. Okay? So neither light there in the city, for the Lord hath given them light, and they shall reign for how long? Yeah, forever and ever. Psalm 27 one thing I have desired of the Lord that I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. So we look forward to that day of serving God and being with him and talking with him and walking with him and spending time with him for all of eternity. So when, remember, notice this too in, in, in Revelation chapter 7. He hears the number... 144,000. But when he turns, what's it say? I beheld. You hear this again? He heard him speak and say 144,000. But when he turned and beheld, he sees a great multitude. Again, Daniel chapter 12 says this, that that time of trouble, after Michael stands up, that great prince, remember? Michael Christ, for those that hopefully you'd had an opportunity to look through the uh, studies on Michael and Jesus being the same character. If you didn't pick one up uh, last night, I still have some more if you're interested. But Michael is Christ because it was Christ that sat down with the Father in the book of Daniel. And it is he that stands up, which means probation closes and a time of trouble takes place. But after that time of trouble is done, what does Jesus come and do? He comes and delivers us, his people. Everyone that is found where? Written in the Lamb's book of life. Many, any of them who have died, right? Any of them that asleep in the dust, they're all going to awake. Some to everlasting life, 
some to everlasting shame and contempt. And they that be wise shall do what? Shine as the brightness of the firmament. And they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. So when we begin to look at this, it becomes very clear to me what this is describing is that the 144,000 is a special group of people, a first fruits, a people that have been sealed by the seal of God. They are sealed before probation closes, right? The The outpouring of the Holy Spirit takes place. Revelation chapter 18 describes this very thing in the first four verses of the Holy Spirit being poured out. And when the Holy Spirit's poured out, it's the same thing that happened to the disciples in the upper room. The disciples in the upper room were also filled with the Holy Spirit. I would say that was a early rain, and they went out as a result, and thousands were converted in a day, right? So what's going to happen just before probation closes? The Holy Spirit's going to pour out His Spirit even more in greater magnitude than when He did in there in that upper room. And many are going to be converted. Many are going to receive, in essence, the seal of God. They will become the 144,000 that God will care for, that God will take care of, that God will shelter, that God will feed. Remember how Elijah was fed by a raven. God will take care of us. But in the end, when Jesus Christ comes, it won't just be the 144,000 that go to heaven. You told me that there were also many people that were done. What? Before probation closed. That had been laid to rest. All of the, anybody who had ever been sealed by the seal of God, anybody who had ever chose to love him from Genesis, Adam and Eve, all the way through time, including the 144,000, will all be rejoicing together in heaven with him. And those people in that great multitude are those. Do you see this again? So the 144,000 is a first fruits. It's a smaller group of the people of God. Could it be some people who are Jewish accept Jesus Christ as their personal Savior before probation closes and receive the seal of God? Absolutely. Anybody who comes out from the world and follows Jesus can be sealed. Now, could there be some that could die as a result of their following of Christ? Yes. But they'll still be part of the what? The great multitude that will celebrate in the kingdom of heaven. But God will take care of that small group, that first fruits of people, that 144,000 during the time of trouble. Because look what it says, Revelation 7, 17. For the lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall do what for those 144,000? He will feed them. He will lead them unto living fountains of water. And God will ultimately one day do what with the tears from their eyes? He will wipe all tears from their eyes. Sin will be removed from the universe. No more death, no more sorrow, no more pain. All of those things will be wiped away from their eyes. So we have nothing to fear during this time. People are like, yeah, but it's the worst that this world has ever seen. My friends, that's why today, right now, We can continue to prepare ourselves. Now, are we guaranteed that we'll be part of that group that's during that time of trouble? No, there's no way of knowing. Could any one of us die tonight? Yeah. So don't concern yourself if I'm 144,000 or the great multitude. What's it matter? All that matters is that right now I'm choosing to follow Jesus. And if I'm doing that, I'm guaranteed to be part of the great multitude. If I'm going through the time of trouble... I'm going to trust that God will take care of me. If God lays me to rest, I mean, the same thing happened in the Old Testament, right? There were many people that I believe helped to build Noah's Ark. I believe it. Methuselah most likely helped to build Noah's Ark. But what's the Bible say happened to Methuselah? He died before the flood. But was he still sealed? Do I still expect to see him in the kingdom of heaven? Absolutely. So that even though Noah and his family went through that flood, did God take care of them? Yes. Was it because that Noah was good with building? Did he have the right kind of pitch and the right kind of wood and the right kind of dimensions? Was that what saved Noah in the ark? No, it was the hand of God that kept him safe inside that boat. And it's the same thing for you and I. If we find ourselves during that time of trouble, we've been sealed by God. We're going to trust in him. He's going to take care of us. He's going to feed us and he is going to lead us. So this says that although Christ will guide them, they will still go through hardships. 
But after the hardships, he's going to wipe away their tears. As I said, this is going to bring up other questions. Because you're going to say, wait a second, I thought we are being raptured before the trouble takes place. I thought we weren't going to have to go through the hardships. Stay with me. Because we've got the next two nights that we have to deal with those very subjects. And we're going to. Because as I said, some of these things that I'm sharing with you can leave you with questions. And the next couple of nights we'll answer those as we go through. But we see Noah and his family, they were being shaken up inside that boat, weren't they? I mean, I don't know about you. Any of you ever been boating before? I was really good on top, on the surface. I was up fishing with my dad. We were just on Lake Ontario. And we were fishing, and I was great until I had to go use the bathroom downstairs. And as soon as I went down the bottom of the boat to use the bathroom, that was the end of my journey. Because when I came back up, I was sicker than a dog. I can only imagine how many days were I in the boat being lost, sloshed around? 40 days? Oh my, can you imagine? I can't imagine. Maybe God had his hand on that too and kept their equilibrium good so that they didn't throw up and get sick. I don't know. But God still took care of them, didn't he? God still take care of him. He'll still take care of us. So this to me really causes questions. It really causes questions on many that believe in a, a secret rapture that's going to take place and, and people are going to avoid this tribulation and, and the only people that are going to go through this are a certain kind of people. And I'm thinking to myself, how can that be? Because the ones that are going, once probation closes, the decision's already been made, Right? If I'm in the boat, I've already got the seal of God. How can I say that I'm in the boat, but I don't have the seal of God? This really starts to bring up a lot of questions. That's why I say, as we go through these next couple of nights, I'm going to try to answer these as we go through the scripture and, and do this. But this makes perfect sense as we parallel this with Noah and his ark. As they went through their time of trouble, so will this first fruits. But God will take care of them. God will protect them. And all, both the 144,000 and anyone else throughout time that has given their hearts to him will be a part of that great multitude. Have we got the warnings today? Was Noah given warnings? He was given them warnings. Are we getting warnings today? I've done it tonight. I've shown you warnings after warning after warning. So when these things happen, we have no excuse are there going to be major storms that are going to happen during this time of trouble? And I don't just mean physical storms. I'm talking about spiritual battles. But God will be with us. Is there going to be a deliverance that takes place for that great multitude to be with him in heaven? Absolutely. You can see the parallels that are taking place between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And God has given us such great things. Matthew 24. But as it is in the days of Noah were... So also will be in the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, what were they doing? They were eating, they were drinking, they were marrying, they were giving in marriage. They didn't seem to care much about any of the warnings they were being given until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will be the coming of the Son of Man be. This idea of a second chance theology really causes problems for me because I don't see it in the Word of God. And that's why I say watch and listen the next couple of nights as we address this. Matthew chapter 24 though, it says, here we are right now, today, Friday night, 2022. We need to spread this gospel. We need tell, to tell people that now is the time. As Joshua says, me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Because we don't know what tomorrow will bring. We don't know what will happen tonight. It was just, just a couple nights ago. It was Tuesday night. I was driving. And as I was driving, a deer jumped out in front of my car. I was going about 45, 50 miles an hour. I mean, he was a foot in front of my car as he went across. And he nailed the other car that was coming this way. And I heard it as he hit that other car. Fortunately, there were some other cars, and so they pulled over and took care of it, and I was, able, I was on my way to do another uh, Bible study with somebody, and so I kept going, because I knew that it would be taken care of. But you look at that kind of stuff, and you go, that could have been the end of one's life right there. I could tell you story after story of where those kind of close times have happened. You and I don't know what the future holds, and so we need to spread this gospel to how many people? Every city. How many races? Every race. How many people? Every person. And we're not going to stop until what? The whole world hears. It doesn't say the whole world will accept it. 
That's not my responsibility. Our responsibility is just to tell them. It's the Holy Spirit that convicts. But we still have a responsibility to tell people this truth. We have to say it with a loud voice. We need to tell people to fear God and to give glory to him. The fear that we think of today is not the fear this is talking about. The Bible says that this fear is reverence and awe. When we come into the presence of God like Moses did, we are reverent and we are in awe. When God parted the Red Seas, can you imagine the awe that those people had as they watched those waters being parted? We have to be in, in this reverence and awe of God too. And we need to tell people to give him glory. So will we be able to stand during this time of trouble? Will we be able to stand? Well, let me just throw this out to you. We need to set ourselves apart for God as his own. We also need to remain fully loyal and devoted to Christ. We need to be rooted and grounded in Christ. We also need to maintain a genuine personal experience with Christ. And we need to let loose all hands except the hand of Jesus Christ. Sometimes that's the most difficult, isn't it? Because we still want to have some sense of control. We're not willing to let God take control. Jesus there, even in the garden, was still wanting to hold on. But what's he say? Not my will, but yours. And the reality is, if Jesus was wrestling with that, then it makes sense that you and I wrestle with it. And if Jesus needed that sort of communication and connection with his Father, then how much more do we? My friends, time is running out. And we need to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. Amen? You know, there's an interesting passage of Scripture that I really like. I was going to pull it up on my phone. I don't know if you have your Bibles here, or maybe there's ones in front of you in Romans chapter 8. Very favorite of mine. I don't know if it is of yours. Romans chapter 8, and I want to just read it to you from Scripture. This is something that you and I need to take to heart. Romans chapter 8, and we're going to read, I'm going to start with verse 37. In all things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor debt, nor anything else in all creation is going to separate me, it's going to separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen? Don't allow anything to come between you and him. He needs to become so important to you and so important to me because we recognize that that lifeline is the key to eternal life. You know, there's an interesting story that I want to end with here. This is actually a personal story about my father. In the early 90s, I had moved away and I had gone down to Texas. And as I shared with you, before I became going into evangelism and in pastoral ministry in 2011, I was an engineer. And I went down to Texas because that's where I was going to college for engineering. And while I was down there, my dad growing up was a roofer. I don't know if anybody in here is, is a roofer or not. My dad did roofing for probably 40 years. But he didn't want me to be in roofing. He wanted me to go to college. And so I was the first of my family to go to college. And so anyway, I went to college. And while I was down there, I believe it was in 1997, I got the call from my mom that my dad had fallen. Uh, my dad was climbing up the roof. He had wooden ladders that he used. And he would polyurethane them to seal them when he would first buy them. And he had done this with this ladder, as he always did for all those years. And I don't know if it was 30 feet up, this roof was, whatever the distance was. He was carrying, I don't know if he was carrying shingles or rubber. I don't remember what it was he was carrying. But he got about halfway up the ladder, and the ladder cracked and snapped. And because he had the weight on his shoulders, when he fell, it actually caused him to go head first the 15 feet down onto the sidewalk. And he actually speared the sidewalk on the edge of the sidewalk and the grass so that it split his, his head open. And um, he ended up going to the hospital. And uh, they were really concerned because what it had done is it had also compressed his spinal cord. And he, at the time, was six foot two. And it compressed his spinal cord four inches. 
so that he was now 5'10". And the doctor told him that, you know, he wouldn't be able to walk or do anything for, you know, six months, probably. Uh, my dad, though, at home, he's kind of, I guess I kind of take after my dad in some ways in the fact that he was not willing to give up. He really worked hard and did things in his bed, trying to work out and, and do things and pushing himself. And six weeks later, he went to the doctor and said that he was ready to go back to work. And the doctor said, you're insane. There's no way you can do that. And my dad said, well, I've been walking to my mother's. And he goes, well, where's your mother? He says, 11 miles away. And he goes, you can go back to work. <laughs> and my dad wrote me, I asked him to write me a letter about the experience that he had with that and, and such. And, it, and my dad passed away just a few years ago in 2019, ended up out of nowhere. Of all the things that he's ever dealt with, he ended up going in for a simple surgery and got MRSA. And it ended up flipping on this thing in his body where he ended up getting uh, some kind of a, a infection. It was, it was just crazy. And he had got autoimmune disorder and his body just started killing itself. And, and he didn't last very long from that. But I remember at the end of this letter what he said after all that he went through and all the hardship and difficulty. At the last sentence he said, God still had a work for me to do. And I think that's the same for us. It's the same for me is that we're here, not by coincidence, not by happenstance. We're here by providence. God has rescued us over and over and over again. For one, to be here and learn these truths. Two, it's for us to go and share these truths with others so that they can join us and be a part of that great multitude and that great celebration in the kingdom of heaven. My friends, I don't know what the outcome of any one of our lives will be. I don't know if we could die tonight, tomorrow, a week from now. I don't know if any one of us will die before probation closes or be alive during the time of trouble. My friends, I don't think that's our concern at all. Our concern is right now accepting Jesus Christ as our personal Savior and being sealed by Him and knowing as a result of that decision of saying, I'm going to follow Him until my last breath, that I am guaranteed to be a part of that great multitude and to be there in celebration with him. Amen? Pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for all that you do. It's just incredible if we were to really see all the times that you have intervened and rescued us from the adversary. But we are here. And we are here for a reason. We are here to learn. We are here to share. We are here to increase this kingdom so that more can be a part of that great multitude. I would ask you that you would be with us tonight as we leave this place. I don't know what will happen, but I know that our future is secure in you. Continue to grow in our lives. We surrender to you. We submit to you. We willingly say, Lord, I'm yours. Continue to grow in each of our hearts and in our minds. We are your people, and we will follow you wherever you go. We thank you again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.